Mac Legends. I hope you're all fantastic. It is time for another installment of Friday Q&A. As always, to everybody who submitted a question this week, thank you so much. If you would like me to answer one of your questions in next week's video, just let me know in the comment section below. Ask me anything you like. A massive shout out to all the amazing people who support me over on Patreon. If you want to join up and get access to some exclusive content, there is a link in the video description. If you instead would rather enjoy some rock music, then there are links to the entire back catalog for my band Ragdoll in the video description as well. We just put out a brand new live album. So if you want to hear me uh, barely know how to play my own songs, go and check that out in the video description. Otherwise, Let's get into this week's questions. What's my favorite mode, key, or scale to play in? This, I genuinely consider a strange question to ask anybody because it sounds like something, if you phrased it towards, I don't know, some other artistic pursuit, you would realize, I guess that it's not gonna give you that much insight into really anything about music or the way I approach music or the way I play guitar. Be like saying to a painter, what's your favorite color to paint with? Or what's your favorite shape or something like that? Uh, surely some people might be heavily motivated by those things. But for me, generally when I'm playing music or I'm putting together a guitar solo, I'm thinking, in much broader terms, like basically like what's the intensity level and how much tension or darkness or brightness or sweetness do I want in a particular section of a song. And thinking intervallically, I think really helps there. So if I was going to say something, I would say, you know, mixed modes. I love the sound of hearing like an ascending major line contrasted with like a descending minor or diminished line or something like that. If you listen to the Ragdoll song Shine or the solo to the song Rust, you know, there's quite a few different melodic concepts kind of packaged into everything. I realize how absolutely pompous this sounds as well, but yeah, I don't think you're going to get a great amount of insight into anybody's thought process by just knowing what their favorite key to play in. You know, if I'm playing drop C, it's probably gonna be the key of C because that low string sounds really, really dark and mean when you play it really, really loud, but uh, that's not a massive factor in anything like that. Another good example would be the Ragdoll song, Heaven Above. When you analyze it, it's like a mixolydian mode on the way up and it is a natural minor scale on the way down. And in the guitar solo, I actually kind of treat it like a dominant sound over the one chord and play the Phrygian dominant mode because that's a fun thing to do. But again, I'm not going, oh, play Phrygian dominantly. And I'm just kind of going, hey, if I pull this note up a little bit, it kind of sounds really, really intense and uh, really fruity. So yeah, I don't have a favorite mode because I think thinking modally is maybe a little bit overrated in the entire guitar sphere. But somebody else did ask, how to play that riff in heaven above. So I'll segue that total cop-out answer into a very concrete answer. Uh, here is how I play heaven above. Here's the quick and dirty version. The hardest thing is tuning your guitar to drop C sharp. So basically just go to drop D, everything one semitone lower. And then I'm gonna think as though I'm in standard tuning. I'm gonna think of all the notes as though I'm in standard tuning, but of course they're gonna be a semitone lower. So we start with an open A chord, then we're gonna play the notes A, C sharp, D, E, and G, all along the third string there. So this is coming from a mixolydian mode. We've got the root, the major third on the way up, the fourth, the fifth, and the dominant seventh interval. Alternatively, fret two, six, seven, nine, and 12, we get this. So I like that ascending part being major. It sounds really bright and really triumphant. And then the second part of it, we're gonna play fret eight on the fifth string. So an F, I'm gonna grab a G, fret eight on the second string. I'm gonna pluck those two together using hybrid picking. And then with my pick, I'm gonna reach down here and play G, A. Then we're gonna play fret nine, seven, and five. That's the fifth, the fourth, and the minor third interval on the way down with a droning fourth string. 
So you have this kind of light and shade thing. You have this triumphant ascending, very bright sound, and you have a darker descending sound there. I really like the symmetry in that. Uh, together, something like this. <laughs> Why don't I have any hum single single guitars in my collection? This is a question that has made me really ponder my entire collection. It's made me think maybe I should take one of my SSS guitars and put a bridge humbucker in it. So yeah, anybody know any good stacked humbuckers for the bridge position? I've actually kind of been thinking for a while, like my Ingve Strat, I should try out something else in there because I love the way the HS3 sounding there, but they, I don't know, they're not the best for everything, put it that way. And I would probably gig that guitar a little bit more if I just had a little bit more variation in that pickup set. So if anybody out there is well versed in the realm of stacked humbuckers, that's probably the way I will go in there. I don't know if I want to like route out for an entire humbucker because if I don't like it, then I'm just going to go back anyway. So I'd need a whole new scratch plate. So yeah, if anybody has any uh, really cool suggestions for stacked humbuckers, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll do a little video where I track one down and take one of my uh, traditional Strat style guitars and add a humbucker in the bridge. <laughs> Influenced by musicals or theater when it comes to writing music. I am going to admit, growing up, I kind of hated musicals, like really, really did not like them. And I know hate's a strong word, but uh, there was something that I just couldn't get over. You know, when sometimes you watch a musical and someone's talking and the next minute they're singing. There was just that particular convention I couldn't get over. And, uh, you know, my wife loves musicals and she slowly, slowly turned me around. And I think it just boils down to the fact that I was kind of judging musicals on like a bunch of crap ones that I had seen. And when you start watching some, you know, proper good ones, they're properly good. And, uh, you know, like probably the majority of the world, we watched Hamilton when the first kind of lockdown hit and I was blown away, absolutely blown away by that. And then it kind of dawned on me, it's like, hey, there's this entire industry of amazingly talented people who have been doing this stuff for a lot longer than rock music has been around. And they're really good at it. And you can do a lot with that particular medium. So I wouldn't say it's anything that's directly influenced me, but I do like a lot of bands who have, you know, a theatrical sound, whether it's bands like Sabotage or Queensryche or Queen or bands from the whole progressive rock era like Yes and Rush, where there is an undeniable influence from theatre and musicals in general. So, yeah, maybe by the time I'm 50, I'll be like playing in a pit for some kind of musical band or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's actually been kind of fun to sort of slowly get into a style that when I was a lot younger and a lot less tolerant of anything that wasn't heavy metal uh, kind of put me off. And now there's some things that I really do enjoy. Have I ever tried a Tremonti PRS? This is a good question because I just saw they're doing that limited run of hand painted Tremontis and basically they're a black PRS with a, uh, you know, wraparound bridge, which is my favorite type of guitar, as you all know. So I have played a few. I've played a few of the SEs, and I think the SEs are fantastic guitars at the price point. And I've played a few uh, kind of upper end Tremontis. The only thing that has put me off actually going and getting one is the fact that a lot of them, or the ones that I've seen for sale that I've you know almost pulled the trigger on, have the PRS Trem Bridge. And I just kind of never use a trem on my guitars. If I'm going to use it live, I'm going to deck the trem anyway. So it always kind of seems like a bit of a waste for me anyway, but uh, they're amazing guitars and, you know, uh, they've been used on some of my absolute favorite songs of the modern rock era as well. So yeah, I'm sure at some point I will probably end up getting one. Uh, otherwise, if there's anyone in Perth with a Tremonti that they want to loan me for a day so I can make a video with one, uh, hit me up. I think that would be a really fun video. I did a similar thing with the DGT 
and that DGT still haunts me. What sort of tone would I recommend people use when they practice guitar? There seems to be two schools of thought here. One is you go for the most unforgiving, kind of brutally clean, mid-rangey sort of tone where every imperfection is going to show in your playing. The idea being that you do that and by the time you go over to, you know, do a gig with a really forgiving tone, you know, all the good grease on there, pitch detune, reverb, delay, all the cheat codes, that you should be a lot more equipped. But uh, there's a quote that always comes to mind uh, from like my under 15s footy coach and it was practice as you intend to play. So basically, since I've been working with that kind of mentality where I practice, where I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna use my main live preset in my rig as my practice tone. Uh, I found it's like a less jarring transition from practicing something to actually playing it live because I've got a consistent factor in there, which is the sound of my guitar. I think there's definitely some merit in the idea of having a very dry, unforgiving guitar tone for practicing certain things, especially when you're learning a technique or you're really trying to woodshed something hard. But, you know, that doesn't have to be all your practice time. Maybe say if you practice for half an hour a day, devote 15 minutes to that unforgiving raw tone and then the other half just go over the top and uh, put all the cheat codes on and have a bunch of fun with it and just see how it changes the way you practice and how you play. And I guess a fundamental thing is trying to maximize the amount of enjoyment you get on the instrument and having great tone definitely makes things more enjoyable. But sometimes, uh, you know, being brutally honest with yourself when you're practicing and really putting in the effort in the right place is like an investment in future fun as well. So yeah, I'm gonna sit on the fence on that one and say, why not both? Fate's Warning, I am so glad this has come up. Fate's Warning to me were the band that I could never get my hands on when I was growing up. There are a few CD stores here that stocked all the Queensryche catalog. Nearly every CD store had the Dream Theater back catalog, and I eventually found one that had all the Sabotage records. So they're like three of my favorite, you know, kind of prog metal bands of all time. Could just never find anywhere that stocked Fate's Warning. And I would read about them all the time, about how underrated they were and how influential they were on the general sound of progressive metal. And, you know, Awaken the Guardian is the one when it comes to Fate's Warning for me. I know they replaced their singer in the late 80s or early 90s, but I've never really got into those particular albums. Uh, not for any other particular reason than like when I want to listen to Fate's Warning, I listen to Awaken the Guardian and uh, Frank Aresti and is it Jim Matheos, the two guitar players? They're like, they're up there with Wilton and DeGamo and, uh, you know, Gorham and Robertson when it comes to my favorite guitar duos of all time, because you can see how they were right on the cusp, on the cutting edge. And it's almost like, you know, in a parallel universe, Fate's Warning would be the band everybody's talking about as opposed to like Queensryche and Dream Theater, even though they did kind of change their sound. And I guess there was a lot of co-evolution in the whole prog metal scene in the late 80s and early 90s. So yeah, they are still, they're kind of like the King's X of their genre, aren't they? Like, you know, uh, you think about Dogman basically being like a grunge rock album and all the other super successful bands in that genre are like, hey, King's X are the band. They're the band we want to sound like. They have the most respect, but maybe the least amount of commercial success. Fate's Warning uh, probably fall into that kind of King's X category for the, uh, for the heavier prog stuff. And yeah, there's my listening recommendation. Go and listen to Awaken the Guardian in full this weekend. Uh, another great band from that era who I think are even more underrated are probably Crimson Glory as well. So if there's any Crimson Glory and Fate's Warning fans in the comments, make yourselves known. This is a uh, this is a safe space for 80s progressive metal. What do I think of John Butler? For anyone not familiar with John, he is probably easily the biggest kind of like roots blues style artist in Australia over the last two decades. And he was just kind of everywhere when I was in high school. He basically had like pop and rock crossover hits. Like the song Zebra is an absolute earworm. And if you wanna hear some amazing 12 string acoustic guitar playing, go and check out the song 
oceans. So uh, John is very much involved with the music scene in Australia and Western Australia, like very much a kind of activist for a lot of grassroots things, including music and non-musical things as well, and has had a pretty amazing career considering that, you know, he basically originated in one of the most far away parts of the world and continues to live here and continues to uh, put out music that a lot of people are really into. So yeah, I was not really into the whole blues and roots thing when I was growing up. I was into like the American blues stuff like Stevie Ray and, uh, you know, the Three Kings and a bunch of stuff like that. Buddy Guy, that was my bag when it came to blues. But I did get to see John live a few years ago and it was one of those things where it clicked. I got it. Amazing, amazing live band, like absolute vibe master. So if you do get a chance to check out John with his trio live, do it because they're a very, very good band. This is one that I see come up a lot in a lot of videos that I do about gear and especially more kind of high-end gear or gear aimed at professional players or the kind of prosumer gear market that a lot of people will comment, I would love to get this, but I don't feel like I'm at the playing level where I either deserve this or can appreciate this. And I would just kind of simply say my philosophy to gear in general is use the best gear that you can afford because it is just one less thing to get in the way. You know, if you don't feel like you're worthy of owning a boogie or an Axe FX3, but you can't afford it and you can spend that money somewhat responsibly, just do it. Get the best thing that you can afford because you will not die wondering that way. I have seen people come in for guitar lessons with me and they've said like, oh, you know, Leon, I'm really struggling with this particular fast run or doing vibrato. And then you play their guitar and their guitar is like, it's got telegraph wires on an action this high. And you're like, well, this might make a good slide guitar, but the fact is that like your guitar is just kind of not up to what you're trying to do. I'm not saying that's going to be everybody. And I think there is definitely a law of diminishing returns once you get to a particular, uh, you know, feature set or level of quality with gear and that kind of price point seems to be coming down further and further with every year. But yeah, you don't don't let your perceived playing ability get in the way of you genuinely enjoying playing guitar because I don't think it's really about being at a particular level. I think it's just about eking out as much enjoyment as you can from the instrument. And I know people who are phenomenal players and you know they make a living playing music and some of them are over guitar. And I teach people who only get about an hour to play every week between their job and their home life and everything else. And it is just the most joyous thing to spend an hour with them playing guitar, teaching them. So yeah, I would kind of focus on that when it comes to music and guitar gear. And don't worry about what other people are gonna think about your playing because in reality, they're probably more obsessed with their own kind of self-perception issues and they're probably not falling asleep thinking about your playing. You know, they saw you play for two minutes in a guitar store or something like that. And, you know, you didn't quite nail that Zach Wilde pinch harmonic. They're not thinking about that. Do it for you. Do it for your own enjoyment and just try to make the most of every minute that you get a chance to play music because it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> for another week everybody i hope you all have a fantastic weekend spend it with the ones you love thanks as always for all your questions this week and uh from me and all the maniacs here hope you have a great weekend take it easy